great to uh, actually look at what I'm going to look at this morning. I'm going to do it in two parts, just to give you the heads up. And I've found a real blessing in this. And I think some of you will be very surprised when we get into the nitty gritty of what I'm going to talk about. First of all, I want to look at Ephesians 5, verse 21. If you've got a Bible, it'd be good if you could use it. I'll be flicking around, but it will come up on the screen. But it's good if you can read it in your own translation of the Bible that you like to read. And therefore, you can understand it a little bit better. And also, it makes sure that what I'm putting up there is right. Think about that. Verse 21 says, We submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. That's a statement to everybody. Now, Paul puts this forward just before he then goes into the next part of what he wants to talk about. But he says, submit one another out of reverence for Christ. Whenever anyone submits as a Christian to anyone else, it's out of reverence for Christ. That's the bottom line of all things. It's because Christ submitted to the Father that we can submit to him and to one another. So it's not out of who's the boss and who's not the boss, it's about submitting out of reverence for Christ. Then Paul goes on and highlights three relationships that most of us will at least be part of one of them. And he, he highlights wives and husbands as the first relationship. Then he highlights parents and children as the second relationship that he's going to look at. And then he goes on about slaves and masters. And he looks at that so we can see if you're in a marriage, the first one's there. The second, if you're a kid, or being a kid, or you've got kids, then there's a second one there. Or if you're in employment, there's a third one there. But regardless of where you stand in any of these relationships, there's principles within them that you cannot get away from, which will be really good for you. I've never heard anybody preach on this next part of Ephesians that we're going to tackle. I've heard lots, I've read some commentaries, and I've heard a few people mention it, but they don't seem to hit the obvious. It's like one of those subjects that they avoid. It's like, don't go there, because you're only going to upset people. Now, I don't think I'm going to upset you this morning. My intention is not to upset anybody. My intention is to show you there is a diamond in here. And if you dig a little bit in the Word of God, there are countless blessings usually just under the surface, that you need to get to. So we'll get there. So Paul's looking at three different relationships. And I want to look at the first half of the first one, just wives today. Next week, bring the guys. I thought we'd be full of guys and no women. Next week, bring the guys. Because next week we're going to look at the man's responsibility. And this week we're looking at the wives. So it's not one way or the other, it's we're going to balance it out. First of all, though, I want to remind you of what it says in 2 Timothy 3.16, this is the message version, and it says this, Every part of scripture is God-breathed and useful one way or another for showing us truth, exposing our rebellion, correcting our mistakes, and training us to live God's way. I remind us of that because when we get into parts of the Bible, we've got to remember all scripture is God-breathed. Everything in the Bible is there because God has designed it to be in there thinking I'm getting a get out of jail free card yet, and I'm saying it's in there for a reason. A while ago I met some friends that I'd not seen for a long time. We bumped into each other, we arranged to go for a, a drink, a cuppa, and we're meeting them there. And this is a conversation when my first friend says to me, he goes, uh, you know, we found that he got married, he said, you won't believe it, I married a girl from, from the south, down from Essex. And he says, and we got married, and he says, uh, within a few days I said to her, he said, I'm being serious. I said to her, I want you to do washing up, I want you to do ironing, and I want you to clean the house. First day, saw nothing. Second day, saw nothing. Third day, she was wrong with it, like a dream. He said, it was amazing. My second friend then said, that's nothing. He said, I married a girl from Wales. He said, after a few days, I told her, I said, you know what, love? I think you're amazing, but I want you to do washing, I want you to do ironing, I want you to do all the cooking. I want you to clean the house and I want you to do the garden and windows. Clean the windows. He says, first day saw nothing. Second day saw nothing. Third day, she ran with it like a dream. I said, that's nothing. I said, I married a girl from Yorkshire. <laughs> I've been married a short time. I said to her, love, you're amazing. 
I don't need to do the washing, I want you to do the ironing, I want you to cook all my meals, I want you to warm my bed for you before I get into it, and I want you to do the garden and wash the cars. First day saw nothing. Second day, still didn't see anything. By the third day, I could just about see out of my eye. <laughs> <laughs> Ephesians 5 continues, verse 22 to 24. This is really what I want to get into this morning. It says, Wives, submit to your husbands as, a, as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and he himself is its saviour. Now as the church submits to Christ, so wives should submit in everything to their husbands. These are not words that often people read, and these are words that are often quoted by men to women, and uh, in a sense of a put down. But I want to read, I just want to point out that in Colossians 3 18, it says this Why submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord? And Titus 2 verse 4 says this This is an instruction to older women as well as younger women. It says, Those older women must train younger women to love their husbands and their children, to live wisely and to be pure, to work in their homes, to do good and to be submissive to their husbands, then they will not bring shame on the word of God. That's an interesting set of scripture there for you. And you've got to look through them. The problem is though, whenever people tackle this sort of subject, they often go to the two extremes. Sometimes they go to submission equals slavery. A little cartoon's going to come up there. Can you read that? It says at the bottom, taking Ephesians 5.22 out of context was bad enough, but using the bell to summon his wife was both stupid and dangerous. See, so it's not saying that you should have a slave in the house. But the other extreme of this is to take submission and say it's relevant in today's society. It's not, it's not really around. I've got another cartoon up there of a lady waiting for her husband to come home. Is he going to be late? Is he drunk? Or has he got lipstick? But I want to set this record straight this morning on what Paul was really putting across. Paul's teaching must not be taken out of context. You need to read it, you need to check it out and not take it out of context. There is a submission of all believers, and that is to Christ. First of all, that's it. We're all to submit to Christ. Paul is not teaching that women are inferior. In fact, Paul ele elevates the status of women and not degrades them. In Paul's day, a woman, children and women were not of any value. In fact, most men had lots of girlfriends, and when they wanted to produce a child, to be an heir, then they would get married. And often they would get married to somebody that was a lot younger than them, and often didn't know them, there'd be no love, there'd be no compassion there, it was just to produce an heir, that was it. So when Paul, people say to me, Paul is a bit out of touch. Actually, when Paul wrote this, it was totally out of touch. It was revolutionary with this stuff. This was radical in Paul's day, because if, if, a, if a person had a child and it died, it were a case of, so what, we can get another one. If a wife died, it was, so what, I can get another one. Ox, wife, child, I can buy another one, I can get another one. That's what it was like. So when Paul talks about submission and things like that, people think, oh. But actually, Paul was being quite radical. And believe it or not, all scripture is God breathed, and Paul wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So Paul wasn't being out of touch, Paul was writing what the Holy Spirit was telling him to. Next one I've put down is Paul is not calling women to be a man's serve, a slave. Some of you feel like you're a slave sometimes, and some people outside tell me they are a slave. But Paul's not telling them women to be slaves to men. Paul is not telling a woman neither that she has no personal identity and cannot be fulfilled outside the home. In those days, the men did work and the women looked after the home. Things have changed a little bit, but the principles are still the same. The question to ask is, when did, or where did the battle of the sectors really start? Because that's what it really boils down to, submission or not submission, is really the battle of the sectors, as they term it sometimes, and they go on about it. 
But it actually started in Genesis 3 and verse 16. It says this is God speaking. To the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and they shall rule over you. Now the word desire there is what it seems to me. Her desire will be for her husband. She'll think her husband's gorgeous. She'll run after her husband. She'll want to hold her husband. She'll want to embrace her husband. And the list can go on. But the next time that word desire, because you've got to look at when does a word first appear, and that's the first time it appears. The next time the word desire appears is in Genesis 4, 7. And it says it's talking about Cain. It says, if you do well, you will not, will you not be accepted. And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. His desire is for you. You must rule over it. That word desire also occurs one more time, and that's in Songs of Solomon. But these two words that we've got here, it actually comes from a Greek, from the Hebrew word, and I can't believe it's, it's tenoshuka, I think, and that comes from the root word, and in original sense, it means to stretch out after, a longing for. Mm -hmm. But the center, it, as we move down, the S-H-U-W-Q, as it put up here, mm -hmm. Its primary root is to run after, to over, i.e. to overflow, and to take over. So the word desire, right at the beginning, in the Hebrew, does not just mean that there's a longing for, a loving for. It's actually also, beyond that, meaning he wants the position and the authority. So God told Eve that because of sin, she would be after her husband's position and authority. But Eve will rule over you. And that's where the tension started, right at the beginning. Because there's often a challenge within some homes and other homes where there's a problem with who is the head of the house. I believe that God's instituted things because he knows what's best. And that's it. So that's where the, the battle of the sex has started. But I want to just get things right. So as we're putting down that getting it right means the meaning of wife is submission. The first point I put down here is the wife acknowledges and affirms the role of her husband as primary leader in the home. There's not many husbands here, but the husband is primary head of the home. That's not my saying, it's what God says. That's it. It's God that sets each of us in our roles. I'll talk about this more next week. Before God, I've got a responsibility for not only you guys, but especially for my wife. God will hold me accountable for Joe. He will not hold Joe accountable for me. That's just the way it goes. He'll hold me accountable for my kids. Responsibilities on my head. Not on Joe's head, on my head. And in leadership in a church, people think, wow, it must be amazing to be in leadership in a church. But there's bigger responsibilities and accountability before God. And the more... Uh, a responsibility to get the greater accountability before God. So some people spy to things and yet they need more accountability. There's a picture I put up here that I found that I like. And that the wife, as much as it looks like it's under, is actually under the protection of the husband. And the husband is actually under the protection of Christ. And we're all held together by Jesus. So Christ is the head, then the husband, and then the wife, and then the kids. That's the order of, house, of, of a household for God. I just think if, if we can master that, if we can work on that, how much better the homes might be. That's God's plan for the home. A quote that I found, it says, God placed the woman into the care of man. She is sheltered by his provision in exactly the same way her children are sheltered by her provisions. A woman who truly sub, uh, subjects herself to her husband actually gains security and contentment in the same way her children feel secure and content in her care. The husband likewise subjects himself to Christ and gains security as, as he casts his anxieties on Christ, knowing that he needs will be met by his head the focus of submission, therefore, is not who his boss, or sorry, who the boss is, but a relationship of mutual trust. 
but, 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 that's what people say, but, but, you don't understand, you don't understand, my husband's no good, it, it don't make good choices, well they made a good choice with you, didn't they? I can tell that people way. if he makes no good choices, but I would say, but he made a good choice in you, but, but, but he's not a good leader, that's not the point. He is the leader. But that's why he needs a wife. To help him. Not to rule over him, but to help him. Genesis 2.18 says this. And the Lord God said, It is not good for man that he should be alone. I will make him a helper. Fit for him. Some versions it says, equal to him. It's not saying that there's a, a difference in, a, in equality, but there is a difference in function. But God gave a woman to man to be his helper. I have to look at this way, but a man's job is to protect his wife at all cost. And her job is not to stab him in the back, it's to help him defend the house, the home, everything else. I put a picture up here, you wouldn't want to meet these two in a dark alley, would you? That's me and Joe went to a fancy dress. <laughs> I've got a gun under there that I were hiding, just a toy gun. Uh -huh. But it wasn't one else. She's my helper. Mm -hmm. She's also my strength, my encourager. And I'm there for her, as it should be for us all. Let's look at 1 Peter 3, verse 1. If you've got a Bible, if you want to turn there, come on the screen, but it'd be good if you could turn there. 1 Peter 3, verse 1. It says, likewise, wives, be subject to your own husband. Your own husbands. It's interesting it starts off with be subject to your own husband. Not to anybody else's husband, but to your own husband. That's why often I try to talk to couples for. Because at the end of the day, the wife is only asked to submit to her husband. Then there is an element of submission to church leadership and things like that. But she's subject to her own, own husband. So that even if some do not obey the word, there may, not, there may be one without a word by the conduct of their wives. That's an interesting verse there. Because it says that there may be one without a word. That's interesting because we need to preach at our husbands. I mean, I've got one, but that's often not said. We need to tell our husband. We need to really point out but actually it says this, but they may be one without a word by the conduct of their wives. Serious stuff. Story from a long time ago, true story. A lady that we knew of, and sat talking to the previous pastor here in a, when he were at Renfall, and we sat talking, and a lady came in and she said, I've decided that my husband needs to get saved. And we said, we have been praying for him for a long time. She said, well, I've told him that we're not having sex until he gets saved. So a pastor turned around and says, sit down, we need to talk. And he's told that, we're still sat there, he says, you need to go home and you need to submit to your husband and you need to be the best wife you could possibly be. You need to shine brighter than all other men and you need to really get in there. And she says, but he's not a Christian. He says, it doesn't say if your husband is a Christian, it says submit to your husband. So he sent her home and she was mad with him to a few men. But she did what was asked. She started and became the best wife this guy could ever have. In fact, to the point where he thought he got remarried. And it wasn't long before he actually gave his life to God. And this is what he said at his testimony at his baptism. I listened to her words for years and it meant nothing. But when I saw her life change, that meant everything. He says, when I knew she took the Bible serious, on the one point that I knew she couldn't take serious, when I knew she submitted to me, he says, all I could do was throw myself at Jesus. Because if she were willing to do that, I had to do it. I mean, what a testimony. If his wife had said, no more, he'd have been divorced. He'd have been, still with, he'd have been on his way to hell. Because she obeyed the word of God, it's changed her life and his life 
And actually, I see him every now and then. And they're both now, I think, in the late 50s, and they're like teenage about the time. They've got the second, third, fourth, fifth wind because they've just fallen madly in love with each other. What woman wouldn't submit to a man if he loved her so much? But she didn't submit at first, and that meant it, that made him love her so much. We often throw things the wrong way around. B, <laughs> not so. A wife must respect her husband. You can read that, and I've put these all together. A wife must respect her husband. Young men do not need love. We, we all love each other, we do need an element of love, but respect is what men really need. Wives need love, husbands need respect. A wife's primary focus is her inward being, not her external things. The wife demonstrates a gentle and quiet spirit. The wife must put her hope in God, not in her husband. That's an interesting one, because sometimes we put too much on the husband. Instead of saying, actually, God, do you know what Joe does? She's, a, she's amazing. But I'll tell you a secret, and ladies, this is one you can pick up on. If Joe's got a problem with me, she takes it to God. And God had to go at me. <laughs> but when I've got a problem with Joe, and I take it to God, he says, I've given you her. You sort it out. <laughs> I get it from both directions. I mean, that is a privilege for you guys. Ladies especially. You don't have to fight the guy. Just go to his boss. Go straight to the top. And say to him, sort him out, and he will. The amount of times I've been annoyed about summer, and I've tried praying, and we'll get on to this next week. And God's there going, sort it out with your wife first. Sort it with her. There's some blessings in here that you, I don't think you appreciate, because of the spirit of the age, it's talking about women's rights and equality and this and that and other. But God's word stands forever. And God's word knows what's right. Yes. And I'm not talking, and I've said, we're not pushing down, we're elevating. Yes. And we're bringing forth the, the, the F that I put down here is the wife listens and follows her leadership of her husband. Sometimes we need to give them a break and let them leave for a while. If your husband actually tells you, I believe God's told me to buy you know, the latest yacht, get it on a loan, and God will provide, yes, slap him. But ultimately, <laughs> When he talks to you about where you're going in ministry, I know a couple, she had a real heart for missionary work. And uh, she married a guy who had a real heart for pastoring a church, local church. So she submitted. They've now retired. Now we're starting to get on the mission field. And she's served so well and God's opening things up for her. 1 Peter 3, I hope it's still there. We'll read verses 1 to 6 now. It says, likewise, wives, submit to your own husbands, so that even if some of them do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives, when they see the respect and, and her pure conduct. Do not let your adornment be external, the braiding of hair, the wearing of gold, and the putting off of, of, of clothing, fine clothes in some versions, but let your adornment be the hidden person of the heart, with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is which in God's sight is very precious. Loud mouth is not very precious to God, but a quiet and gentle spirit is. For this is how the only women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their husbands. Hang on a minute, let's read that again. For this is how the only women who hoped in God, used to adorn themselves by submitting to their husband. As Sarah obeyed, her, uh, obeyed Abraham and called him Lord, and you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Amazing verse there. Yes, written by a man. And you could say, well, it was written by a man, a woman would never put this. Actually, inspired by the Holy Spirit, she would, but it was Peter that wrote it. The interesting thing there is, it's not saying that you can't wear pretty clothes, makeup and things like that. What it is saying is you shouldn't rely on them to shine your beauty. You shouldn't rely on external things to shine who you really are. Actually, I would say to some people, you know, sharpen up, a bit of paint would, you know, help, that sort of thing. I don't want this church to turn out like the Amish. You know, when you all have a bob, long skirt to the floor, we're all looking beige. 
and I'll never wear suits. I don't want that. And that's not what it's saying. You've got a sort of quote of this and say, it means you shouldn't. So don't be getting the tissue with that and rubbing the makeup off. It's not saying that, but what it is saying is let your beauty come from within and let it shine out. That's what it's saying. Now this is a gem. This is such an amazing thing. This has hit me like a brick in the face. This is like so unbelievable. It says, submit to her husband as Sarah obeyed her husband Abraham and called him Lord and you are her children. Why did he pick Sarah? Why out of all the women in the Bible did he pick Sarah? I mean, let's look. There's Ruth in the Bible. There's Ruth, wow, she, a woman of integrity. A woman, oh yeah, you could have picked on her because she submitted to Boaz. She was there, she is somebody that can hold up high. But he did pick Ruth. He could have picked Esther. I mean, let's face it, Esther must have been a gorgeous looking woman. I mean, the king spotted her and went, whoa, you know, she became queen. But he didn't pick her. Why Sarah? Why did he pick this woman who was, you know, an old biddy, basically? Why? To example her of a woman you know, who shines beauty, he picked Sarah. Why? Because I believe that God renewed her youthfulness. I'll tell you how I think that. She's in her 80s, and there's a king walking along going, whew, she's all right. I don't know if wolf whistling was allowed in those days, but he probably would have done. And he grabbed her. Is she married? Abraham told a bit of a fib. You know, she's my sister. Actually, she was his sister. Same dad, different mum. So it wasn't quite a lie, but it wasn't all the truth. I mean, a king grabbed his 80 year old. Actually, it happened twice. I don't know how old it was, she was the first time it happened. You can read this in Genesis 12 and Genesis 20. So she wasn't. There was something about her. And Abraham got promised to have a kid. And if, without being, I mean, if you look at his wife, it needed something to encourage him, if I can put it in those terms. She must have been a stunner. There must, and it wasn't just, I mean, she was in her 80s. I don't know how but I've not seen any really, 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 really good looking 80 year olds around. And some of that, you know, it, there must have been something about Sarah that these kings looked at, and it wasn't that like she was really spiritual. There was something inside, it's not beauty. I think God renewed just that he just didn't heal her womb. He healed her entire body. She must have had something about her that shone out. Why? Because she submitted to her husband. And it shone out. If you want to use the latest cosmetics, fine. But if you want a glow that comes from within, maybe what Peter's saying here. Maybe Peter's putting forward a promise here. Maybe this is a gem that's hidden in there for you to dig up. Why be, uh, be subject to your own husbands? Then you'll shine. Then you'll radiate. Then you will just be. You know, people might think, well, they're good looking. It's not about looks. The body dies, it'll be buried, it'll be gone. But you will shine from the inside. I said this recently to somebody. If you want to look for a girlfriend, you know, for, I said, when I was growing up when I was in youth groups, the sort of girl I looked for was one that was full of the Holy Spirit. Because on the outside, they will just change. But what's on the inside will only get better. And I said, I looked for a girl that was full of the Holy Spirit. Sarah must have been somebody that had something about her that shone. I believe that God renewed her youthfulness. I'm not saying it made her like a 70 year old or 20 year old or anything like that. I'm not saying it made her like Miss World, the wanted world peace or something like that. But we're I'm saying God must have done something with her and it was because she submitted to her husband. You're not getting it, are you? Everything in the Bible has, has promises and blessings connected to it. Whenever you read something, you see it, oh, that's a negative, read it a bit more and find out there's usually a blessing there. Instead of saying no and being pig headed and stubborn, dig down and see the blessing that God's got for you. Dig down and see. So basically, 
Somebody who is submissive to their husband in the order that God's put thing will be blessed, not only from her husband, but will shine something within her that brings glory to God. You know, a good facelift might take some wrinkles out, but I'll tell you something, a good God lift will change everything. And I'll tell you this, men may sometimes look on the outside, but they look into the eyes. And the eyes are what shines. And that's what they're looking for. Godly men look for godly women for shine. I say shiny eyes, not bright eyes, but, but eyes that are shining Jesus. Proverbs 12, verse 4 says this. It says, A wife of normal character is her husband's crown. Crown for her husband. So, second point, what is the motivation for being a, a, wife, a, a submissive wife? Or what, the motive, the motivate of a wifely submission. I think I've got that the wrong way around, but anyway. What's the motivation behind submission for you guys, for anybody? For us all, because it's not just wives, but it's also we need to submit to one another and submit to God. First, the wife must, is motivated by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit obeys the Word of God, and, and you know, the Holy Spirit is the Word, it brings it alive. So our motivation, your motivation, um, is, from, is from the Holy Spirit. You've got a choice to make. Do you do your thing or his thing? Do you do what you want or what he wants? A wife's motivation is by a saviour's pleasure. Because we read in, in verse 22, as to the Lord. You submit to your husband as to the Lord. If you submit to God, you submit to your husband. I had one guy, I, I read this as well, that you can often tell a person's spiritual walk is how they treat their husbands. An interesting one. In return, you can often tell a man's spiritual walk how he treats his wife. Yeah. A wife is motivated by God's perfect plan, established for her protection and security. The husband's job is to protect and, and bring security to the wife and to the home. And that's the way God instituted it. That's what God put forward. That's the way he did it. I read recently that a lot of marriages actually break down, Christian marriages break down because a lack of submission or a lack of love. He doesn't love her, she doesn't submit to her. He should do this, she should do that. It all boils down to, does he love her, will she submit to him? What woman couldn't resist a guy who just loves her to this? What guy couldn't resist a woman who submits to him? Models for submission. Christ, who submitted himself to the Father to be our Saviour. Verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Saviour. Jesus submitted to the Father's will by coming to earth and dying on the cross for us. He submitted to that, knowing it would cause him great pain. Knowing it would seriously hurt him, knowing the Father would turn away from him. He knew all that and still submitted because he loved us and cared so much for us. It kind of puts out sometimes human petty, well, I'm not going to submit to him over this. It kind of puts it away when you think of the price that Jesus paid in submitting to the Father. Another example is the church, which submits itself to Christ as head. Now, verse 24 says this, Now, as a church submits to Christ, so also wives should, make, should submit in every way to their husbands. I believe as a church we do submit to Christ. And if we're not, me and Phil and Dave are in trouble. Because God will not be mocked. And if we stand in the way, God will remove people. Simple as that. My head, Dave and Phil's is on the line. If we don't submit, this church to God, to Christ. Something else to think about, and I'm going to round up now, is that a husband and wife, a marriage, is a pattern or a shadow of Christ and his church. That's Paul's developing the idea of the church here 
and he's using marriage as an example, not only to tell we need to submit and we need to love, but also as an example to the submission that he did for us and the love he poured out for us. An husband and a wife is a pattern and a shadow of Jesus and the church. And that's why it's under attack so much. Marriage is, you know, marriage in itself was just two people getting together, making a commitment, final care, to it matter, there's no real God, we're fine. It wouldn't matter so much, but why is there such a thing within society and in our society to dismantle marriage altogether? When it is, common sense dictates that marriage is a, is a bedrock of society, and yet they're just eroding it and eroding it. What is it? I think there's a, there is a spirit of rebellion around, and we aren't getting too much into that sort of stuff. There is a spirit of the air that's really demolishing marriages, and it's a, a, there's a rebelliousness around. There's rebellion in the whole families, there's rebellious in homes, there's rebellion in relationship. It's all, everything's going wrong. Everything's just, you know, mismatch where, where kids want to be on top of the parents and, and everything's just getting twisted and just taken out of context. And it's because there's a rebellion going on. There's a rebellion in kids, a rebelliousness in youth, rebelliousness in adults. It all boils down to me, 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 me. The reason why, in some cases, there's no submission because the submission is out of question because it's all about me. It's not about anybody else, it's about me. The reason why people don't submit to one another is because it's not really about them, it's about me. That's what it boils down to. When God, I think Peter said, um, spoke here uh, Saturday, a week Saturday ago, and he was talking about the one another's. If we listen to the one another's, it would change our lives, your lives. If you actually did, did the one another's. And I've only pointed one out, submit to one another. But it's not about, it's about me, be me. There's rebellion in the workplace. I don't know if you've ever sat with group people and they think they can tell the government what to do. The government should do this, the government should do that. The government can't do anything. The government can't bring any changes in, really. They can't change anything. Only God can do that. I told the group people, stop complaining and start praying. That change things. I says, when we start humbling ourselves before God, so there's a rebellion in the workplace, there's a rebellion in authority. There's a rebellion in the church, generally. Question. We need to ask ourselves, every one of us, is what blessings do we miss out on because we do not submit? What blessings have been missed because people don't submit to their husbands? What blessings have been missed because they don't submit to the leaders? How many kids are missing out on great <coughs> blessings because they don't submit to the parents? Ultimately though, what blessings are we all missing out on because we don't submit to Christ? I hope I've not really offended anybody. If it's upset you, that's what the Bible says. But ultimately, the gem, the diamond that's in here is what am I missing? What blessings am I missing because of my unwillingness to submit to Jesus? That's ultimately it. Because Paul brings it right round back to Jesus. He starts with Jesus and he finishes with Jesus. And it's all about Jesus, really. People argue about submitting and not submitting. But the truth is, the Bible's clear. We're not to be, no one's to be a slave. But it said, why submit to your husbands as to the Lord? For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and, his, and he himself is saviour of it. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives submit in every way to your husband. He starts with wives, goes to husbands, then goes to Jesus. And he goes from husbands to wives, back to Jesus, or to Jesus, to husbands to wives. He runs it round. Mm -hmm. Because our example and everything we have is demonstrated through Jesus. Mm -hmm. And that's the key. 
I would encourage every one of you to submit to those people that you need to submit to. And over the next few weeks, we'll look at a few other stuff. Because only me and Davey for the next few weeks will understand you don't like it. <laughs> next week, girls, make sure you get your chaps here. I'm telling you. <laughs> Some big stuff. But it really, it really made me think from studying this. What are we doing that's stopping us having everything that we need from God? And it's because we don't submit to Him, to each other. We can blame this, blame that, point this, point that. But that's, where it, that's the bottom line really, isn't it? Men need to be men and become the head of the household like they're called to be and lay down everything for the blessings of God on the bad household, regardless, and I will say this, and it's on record, regardless of the, what the wife thinks, my job is to ensure that our house stays godly at whatever cost in God that is. And if she don't want it, I'm still going to move forward in God. Because that's what I'm called to do for the sake of her and for the sake of my kids. And that's for us all. Wives, I would say this, you pray for your husband. You pray that he becomes the godly man that you've dreamed about if he's not there. You pray that he becomes a leader that you've dreamed. And you might say, but I want to wear the trousers. Pray that God will just empower him, encourage him. You, can, you know, there's nothing, I can encourage people to a certain point, but the person who lays next to them and is in their ear can either discourage or encourage. And you can encourage somebody to become mighty in God. I think sometimes all men need some encouragement to be strong and just say, I'm here with you. If you succeed, I'm with you. If you fail, I'm with you. And what man wouldn't rise up for that? But ultimately, you could ask yourself this. Am I submitting to Christ? Because if you submit to Christ, everything else will fall in place. If you put him at the first and the forefront of everything, if you focus on Jesus and you put your life in his hands and say, I'm just going to lay it in your hands now, Lord. That's what it's about. Then he will put everything in place. I know if I want my house to be a blessing, I've got to go before Jesus first. If I want my wife to be glorious, I go before Jesus first. My kids, whatever. I've still got responsibility to come back and to talk to them, do things. But ultimately, I go before Jesus. And that's what we all should do. So this idea of saying, I don't want to submit, it's not about that. The Bible's clear. If you want to be glorious, if you want to shine as a lady, if you want something about you that's completely different, you want your beauty to come from within, submit. But for us all, we should all be ready to just submit, submit before God. It's interesting that we often say, Lord Jesus. But like Peter, sometimes we say, no, Lord. And the two don't go in the same sentence. So I want to encourage you. Don't just look at these verses as a negative or something to quote to the wife. Or you to just, in a sense, black out with your Bible. Look at these as a real blessing. Knowing that you obey the word of God. There's a blessing attached to this. There's something beyond the normal. But why did he say you'll be a doll, you know, a child of Sarah? He didn't tell me I'd be a child of Sarah. He's not talking to me. He's talking to the women. Yeah. Think about it. Check it out. Look it up. <clears throat> Research it. Find it for yourself. Don't look at things in the Bible that are negative. There's often a real blessing. Yeah. Just beneath the surface if you dig a little bit. Yeah. And as much as I wrote, read those verses out from different parts of the Bible, <laughs> just to point out that it's not just one point. The truth is that we have a God that loves us, that we're willing to submit everything to his Father to come to us. And therefore he expects us to submit everything we have to him. Everything to him. It's not about what you think is right or wrong. It's not even how you are treated. It's about are you willing to submit to God and submit to the properly things in order that God set up. That's challenging, isn't it? 
but next week, us men, we bad it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Until then, let me just pray for you. Emily Bab, I just thank you that you loved us so much, that you cared for us so much. Jesus, I thank you that you submitted to the Father and came. And Lord, you're the head of the church now, and the church submits to you. But Lord, I pray for us all that we will learn to submit to one another and to you. That we will stand before you and lay down everything we have before you. Lord, I pray that every man will be a real man that will stand, that will lead his wife into great things. Lord, I pray for every wife. Lord, that will, Lord, I pray that they will just get behind their husbands and pray. Lord, and the people that are neither, Lord, I pray that you will give them the desires of their heart. Lord, that you will open doors up, Lord, that you will give them the things that they're asking for. Lord, if they're older, Lord, I pray they'll teach the younger ones, Lord. Lord, if they're young, I pray that you'll just fill them so much with your spirit that they will shine for you. Lord God, I pray for everyone in here that we will not just be, Lord, little Christians that come on a Sunday and go, that we will be the men and women of yes. God that you've called us to be. Yes. Lord, that we will shine you, Lord. Yes. Lord, as we walk in the streets, Lord, we'll know that we've got angels around us, the Spirit of God within us. Lord, that we are mightier than conquerors, Lord, that we can do all things through you. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you will just shine out of us. Lord, let your spirit ooze out of us and touch the people around us, our neighbours, our friends, Lord, our relatives. Lord, I pray that even as we walk down the street, your spirit will go into and touch lives like it did with Peter. Lord, bless your people. Be with your people. Lord, help us all to realise that you only think of good for us. Lord, that you have great things, amazing things for us. Lord, let your spirit just inhabit your church, Lord, your people. Lord, and teach us all, Lord, just to submit to one another and ultimately, Lord, to submit to you. Thank you.